Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network here in my native island of Trinidad with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. It is the first uh, um, session in the month of uh, Jumadi al Akhir, and so we now have three months left uh, for Ramadan. I hope you don't mind my reminding you, all right? If you get fed up of me, I will still remind you. There are three months left for Ramadan and uh, the, the month of Jumadi al-Akhir. And then there is Rajab and then there is Shaban. That makes three, doesn't it? My counting is correct? Okay. And uh, we know that the most important sunnah, I'm not talking about the obligatory, I'm talking about the sunnah. The most important sunnah of Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, is to recite the whole Quran from cover to cover. Sheikh, you've been saying it again and again. Why it? say it again? <laughs> Be patient with me. Be patient with me. All right? It is the most important sunnah for Ramadan that you must recite the whole Quran in Arabic, of course, from cover to cover. And uh, this is a sunnah which was established by Allah himself, that he sent Jibra'il alayhi salam every night of Ramadan. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam would have to recite the Quran completely as revealed to that time. Except for the last uh, year of his life when he had to repite Re recite the whole Quran twice. Sheikh, but we've heard it so many times already. Never mind. <laughs> Let me repeat it. If you have never, never, never recited the whole Quran from cover to cover in Ramadan in your life, then do it this time. Let this be the first time. You have three months in which to prepare, to learn, to recite the Quran in Arabic. And once you make the effort, we are happy, we are pleased with you. And may Allah bless your effort with success, so that when the day of Eid comes, you'll be able to say, I fulfill this sunnah. I recited the whole Quran from cover to cover in Ramadan. And then after Eid, we say to you, now continue every month for the rest of your life. The Prophet spoke about a journey, which is Allah loves this journey, that when you finish, you start again. You finish, you start again. So they asked, which journey is that? And he said, this is the journey that you start from the beginning of the Quran, and you recite to the end, and then you start again, and you recite to the end, and you start again, and you recite to the end. Others have their own way of preparing for Ramadan. This is my way. I want you to learn to recite the Qur'an in Arabic. There's no Qur'an in English. Forget that. Now then, what about those who say, well, I am not going to do it. 
That's it. I'm not going to do it. I'm no one going to impose upon me to learn to recite the Quran in Arabic. I'm happy as I am. So we say to you, we don't want to see your face. We don't want to shake hands with you. You are a danger to our community. Stay away from us until you change your views and you begin to humble yourself before the Book of Allah and show the, the faith in the Book of Allah that should be there in your heart to recite the Quran. Now then, uh, let us begin with uh, announcements. And that is that I've been talking about a class that I want to have here in and And uh, we now have a venue. And the venue is a masjid, alhamdulillah, a masjid. And it is uh, close to my hometown, Shaguanas. It's the Endeavor Masjid, close to the highway, Endeavor Village, Shaguanas. And, uh, but I have a problem. I don't know how to announce the beginning of the class because this month, uh, of, uh, this month of February, I may have surgery on my knee. Uh, the hospital has to decide on a date. And once I have the surgery, if they decide on surgery, then it will be some time before I can walk again. I have to use the crutches and so on, you know. It takes about six weeks. So make dua that Allah might uh, uh, help me and I might have a successful surgery, inshallah, on my knee. And then after that, we can announce the date uh, for the class to commence. Um, then the other announcement is again for me to repeat to you, to remind you, particularly if you're in the United States or in Canada, that we're organizing a seminar on Dajjal, an all-day seminar, as I did in Birmingham, in Britain, on uh, December the 16th. So we repeat that here in Trinidad, uh, and it will be in the last week of December, uh, probably Saturday, December 28th, if that is the, the date for the Saturday year. Uh, the venue is still to be decided upon, so that's a subsequent announcement. But you can begin your plans from now, particularly if you are in the United States and Canada. You don't have to come from Britain and Europe. No, no, no. We can do it over there for you. You don't have to come. But if you're in the United States and Canada and South America, Central America, then here is your chance to come to Trinidad to attend this seminar on Dajjal in four sessions uh, on most likely Saturday, December the 28th or this, this year. Then uh, the next uh, announcement was that I announced last week uh, that I'm offering to send an autographed copy of the entire set of my books. And of course, it can only be autographed here in Trinidad. I can't do it in Britain and in France and Germany, and uh, I can't do it in Malaysia and so on, because there are several books of mine which were published 20, 25 years ago. And the copies are available only here in Trinidad. It, we don't have sea meal from Trinidad, and it's too expensive to ship it from Trinidad by air. So what can we do? Um, so I said I have 20 sets complete. And after that, I start running out of books. But I was wrong. I didn't have 20. I had only 15. And uh, alhamdulillah, we already have orders for all 15. Um, uh, this book, uh, Surah Tul Kaf, the text translation and commentary, uh, this book is already out of print. We have only one copy left here, one. Um, and I'm not reprinting it because I have decided, I realized that the Quran cannot be translated. It took me 75 years to realize that. I imagine that that the miraculous word of Allah cannot be translated. And this book was a text translation and commentary. So I'm going to have to make some adjustments now before it can be reprinted. And I don't have the time to do it. As soon as I get the time and I can make the adjustments, then we can reprint this book. So you won't get this book now if you order. And uh, this one, the prohibition of riba in the Quran and Sunnah, sorry, the importance of the prohibition of riba in the Quran and Sunnah. I thought I had 20 copies, but I only have 15. And all 15 now are ordered. 
So you won't get this copy anymore until we, we reprint. But what we're doing is um, I'm writing a new book entitled Dajjal and Money. And the first chapter of that book would be an edited version of this book, yes. Um, so now if you order a complete set of my books, these are the books you're going to get. Here we are. Here's George Bernard Shaw and the Islamic scholar, which is a conversation that took place in 1935 in Mombasa, when uh, Maulana Abdul Alim Siddiqui, who was the teacher of my teacher, the sheikh of my sheikh, Maulana Muhammad Abdul Alim Siddiqui, rahimahullah, he was in Mombasa in Kenya. And uh, George Bernard Shaw was on board a ship going to South Africa, and he stopped in Mombasa. And when he heard that Maulana Abdul Alim Siddiqui was there in the city, he requested I'd like to meet with him. And they met and they had a conversation and that conversation was recorded. And uh, this, is a, this is a commentary on that conversation here. Yeah. Uh, this is um, explaining Israel's imperial, mysterious imperial agenda based on the analysis of the Qur'an, the, the verses of the Qur'an, and the hadith of Nabi Muhammad This is uh, on Khidr alayhi salam, uh, in search of Khidr's footprints in Akhir zaman In search of Khidr's footprints in Akhir zaman You know about Khidr alayhi salam. He is the scholar, the model scholar. And this is the model of scholarship for Akhir Zaman Khidr, in which Allah says about him, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ ilma. Knowledge does not come to him only from external sources, but also internal. And this is um, Iqbal and Pakistan's moment of truth. And uh, it, it is a, a critical evaluation of the thought of that great, great, great scholar who is my teacher as well, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, may Allah have mercy on his soul, is a great scholar. We have great admiration for him, but even great scholars can make mistakes. <laughs> and so we, we have a critical commentary on his scholarship here pertaining to politics and the state. Okay, here is a book which was published, I don't know, 20 years ago on Isra and Miraj, um, it combines with Ramadan. Uh, and this book can be obtained only from Trinidad, only from Trinidad. And I have not uh, reprinted it as yet. So when you order a complete set, then you'll get this book as well. And uh, you'll get it autographed, <laughs> inshallah. Uh, the gold dinar and silver dirham. Islam and the Future of Money. And uh, this is a subject in which the world of Islamic scholarship has failed. And I hope you don't mind my saying so. We, yes, we have love for our brothers, the scholars of Islam. Uh, we do not, do not disrespect our brothers, the scholars of Islam. But when they have failed, we have to say so. And we have to warn them that you have failed on the subject of money and the economy and the Islamic banking, this so-called bogus Islamic banking system. Here we are, Medina returns to center stage in Akhir zaman What is the role of Medina? It used to be Yatrib. In the Quran, the word Yatrib is used. And then after the death of Nabi Muhammad Islam, they chose to give it another name, namely Medina, Medina to Nabi. This one is my old travelogue. I have a new travelogue, which is 2007 to 2008. But this travelogue is for 2001 to 2003. That old travelogue, which you've never seen. And this is available only from Trinidad. Uh, the Quranic method of curing alcoholism and drug addiction. If you use the correct methodology, the correct methodology for the study of the Quran, which I got from my teacher, Maulana Fadur Rahman Ansari, 
then you can see how the Quran has given you a method by which you can, you can cure people of addictions. There are many different kinds of addictions. There's addiction to drugs. There's addiction to alcohol. There's addiction to sex. There's addiction to cigarettes. There's lots of addictions. And the, the problem is, how do you cure someone from addiction? And the answer, you've got to take control of the heart. The heart has to be controlled if you want to cure someone from addiction. But you read that book and you'll get it. Here is um, a Muslim response to the attack on America. And this, the attack on America took place in September 2001. And this book was published published in December 2001, and I don't regret any word I wrote in this. My analysis was correct. The whole, whole American, all the whole people, all those who live in America now, except those who are deaf, dumb, and blind, all recognize what I've said in this book is correct. And that is the attack on America was planned and executed by the CIA and by the Israeli Mossad. This here, is the religion of Abraham and the state of Israel. It is an enormous amount of research in this book. Um, uh, and uh, it shows how we are where we are now with the Holy Land. What are the changes which they made in the book of Allah, the Torah, in order to lead us to where we are now in, with Israel and the Holy Land and the Palestinians here. Yeah. The religion of Abraham and the state of Israel. But this book is available only from Trinidad. It was published, I don't know, 20 years ago. Fasting and Power. The, the, the previous book I had here, where is it? Yeah. Uh, the one on... on, on, on um, the one on uh, Isra and Miraj has uh, another um, section on fasting. I took that and I built up this one here. Fasting and power um, to prepare you for the fast of Ramadan, to explain to you that the fast of Ramadan was meant to build power. Here is uh, my first book. My teacher ordered me to write this book. And uh, uh, there's a story of how I wrote this book. And you'll find that story in my travelogue, uh, Islam and Buddhism in the Modern World. It was written by orders of Maulana Fadur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. And he wrote, the, he wrote the forward to this book. And you can read it here, what he says. Here is a lovely book. I'm happy with this book. The Strategic Importance of Dreams and Visions in Islam. Um, this is a subject in which we can challenge the secular scholarship and show them that their epistemology is wrong, that knowledge comes only from external observation, the scientific method, wrong. That knowledge can also come from another source that is externally acquired and this one is internally received and that's true dreams and true visions, okay? It's a beautiful book to read, yeah. And here is an old book of mine, The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. And I'm working on this book now to try to bring it out in a new version as Money, Dajjal and Money. Uh, we still have some copies left of this, um, The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah, but they're only available here in Trinidad. Here is another one from Trinidad, written, oh, 20 years ago, one Jamaat. One Amir, one Jamaat, one Amir. How should a Muslim community be organized? This is the first book on Dajjal. Uh, I left Malaysia in 2016 and came back to Trinidad to write my book on Dajjal because people were saying to me, Sheikh, you are the only one who can write this book. And they've been waiting for 10 years. But I could not get the time in Malaysia because too many people coming to visit me, too many lectures, no time at all, none. I couldn't even recite the whole Quran in one month in Malaysia until I got fed up. And I took a vow before Allah. I said, I take a vow. I'm going to recite the whole Quran once a month. 
And since I took the vow, alhamdulillah, I've been able to do it. I've been able, Allah has given me the time to do it. So I said, let me come back to Trinidad and get, a, get the time here to write. And I realized I cannot write one book on the job. No, it has to be several books. So this is the first book, praise be to Allah, that this is written. Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwalu Zaman, or the beginning of history. You get a lot of surprises when you read this book on methodology, methodology for study of the Quran. This is my first book, my first book on es ep eschatology, Jerusalem in the Quran. Uh, a very famous scholar, may Allah have mercy on his whole Dr. Kalim Siddiqui. I, I just visited his grave in Slow, outside of London, uh, who was like an elder brother to me. And he was a very famous political scientist, a great scholar of Islam, living in Britain, Pakistani. And uh, he, he organized an Islamic conference in London in 1976. And, uh, I flew from Pakistan to London to attend that conference. And in between the conference, he sat down with me for a cup of coffee. And then he said to me, Imran, you got the training from Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, and you have political science and international relations. You have to write this book, Jerusalem and the Quran. So he gave me orders to write this book. And uh, alhamdulillah, it took me 27 years, but the book was written, Alhamdulillah, Jerusalem and the Quran. This one, the Caliphate, the Hejaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. This was a chapter of my thesis, my PhD thesis uh, in Geneva on, uh, on post-Caliphate post Islam and the search for a new Islamic public order. Um, but at that time in Geneva, in the 1970s, I did not have eschatology. So thank Allah that I left Geneva without defending that thesis and publishing it because I would have been embarrassed today. Because my views in that, that thesis were like a schoolboy, schoolboy really, because I had not yet studied the Quran on that subject properly. And Allah has not blessed me with the knowledge of eschatology. So now I have revised uh, one chapter of that book, which was meticulously researched at the UN Library in Geneva. And here we have the Caliphate, the Hejaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. This is a book I am so happy that Allah blessed me to write it. Methodology for Study of the Quran. If I had this book when I was 20, 21 years of age, if I had this book at that time, I could have traveled faster in the world of knowledge. Morana Fadlur Rahman Ansari should have written this book. No, he didn't do it. But he did write the Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. It's written in very technical language. And I took what was there in his book, and I took what he taught me, and I gave you this book, Methodology for Study of the Quran. If you are in charge of a Darul Uloom, I urge you, please read this book and put it for your students that they can learn to think and study the Quran the proper way. This is the Islamic travelogue that I talk, spoke about earlier. Uh, my travels from 2007 to 2008. And people love, they love to read this because it's as you are walking with me and traveling with me and seeing things through my eyes. So they would love me to write another travelogue. Sheikh, we love this, but I don't have the time for it. I have more important books to write. So this is the Islamic travelogue. And here is uh, three more books. Surah al kaf and the Modern Age. It is my tafsir, uh, sorry, my ta'wil, my interpretation of the very important uh, content of this surah, uh, which is the surah of Akhiru Zaman, Surah al -Kaf. A very important book to read. Uh, this is my book on Gog and Magog, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scholars don't agree with me. 
So read what I have to say and listen to what they have to say, and then you make up your mind. And here is an es a collection of essays over the years on matters pertaining to Akhil Zaman, uh, Signs of the Last Day in the Morning. It's a big book, huh? Yeah. Um, and that is, those are 20, how much? 25 here. Uh, two more to make 27. Um, so, you know, these are 26 here. And two more to make 28. And they are on their way coming by air mail. One is um, the Quran, the Great War, and the West. That is the Malhama or the Armageddon. It's a small book. And uh, until that book arrives by air mail, I can't autograph a complete set. And then there's my last book, which is entitled Constantinople in the Quran. A delightful little book. And it is on its way from Malaysia um, by air. And as soon as it arrives, inshallah, then those two will be added to these. And then I'll be able to uh, autograph a complete set for you. There are six, 16 people have already ordered complete sets. But then I got sad news that there were so many who, yes, Sheikh, we want a complete set of your books, but we cannot afford it. We cannot afford it. So then Allah gave me an idea. Alhamdulillah, thank you Allah, that you give me this idea that how can I help those who are too poor, they cannot afford, it's difficult for them, but they want to get a complete set of my books. They are hungry for knowledge. And I am delighted when I meet people who hunger for knowledge because I live amongst people here who I could spend the rest of my life here. They would never come to my home to ask a question. They will never come to ask for knowledge. No, they have other things more important. Imran is not important. So how happy I am when I meet people who are hunger for knowledge. Should I not pay attention to these rather than to these? Yes. So I have a good idea. And that is that if you want to order, if you want to get a complete set of all my books autographed by me, and uh, you want to get it free of charge. All you have to do is to pay the cost of the airmail. That's all. And you'll get a complete set of course, books free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. Provided that you do a little bit of work for me. That's all. And that is, uh, if you can get orders for me for, say, five, five sets of books, that's all. And you can do that from your computer. You don't have to do any other work. Uh, go to my bookstore, imranhussein.com, imranhussein.com, and there you see all the books advertised and the prices, all. And then you send that link, uh, imranhussein.com, to your friends and relatives and people whom you know, uh, inviting them if they would like to order a complete set. And once they give, they say, yes, we'd like to get a complete set, and I am informed about it, then that is recorded in your name. And if you get five, just five of those, then I will send you a complete set of my books free of charge. I consulted with businessmen here in Trinidad. Excuse me, up to last night. They said, Sheikh, this is too generous. No, 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 they should get you 10 orders before you, you send them a complete set of giving away the books. I said, no, I, I feel no, 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 no. Um, I prefer to be generous because there are so many people who help me to print my books. Yes, from many parts of the world, and for 20 years now. So only sometimes do I have to find the money myself from my own pocket to pay the cost of printing. So all of these people have been helping me. Why should I not help others? They were said, no, it should be 10 sets, not five. I said, no, let's make it five. So send me an email if you would like to get a complete set of my books free of charge. 
you just have to pay the cost of shipping and uh, five orders. So when you get the five orders for me, then I'll send it to you free of charge. Okay. We now have uh, to turn once again to a dangerous situation next door in Venezuela. Excuse me. And to make a second comment on Venezuela before we pursue uh, the questions again, questions and answers. And that is that Allah in the Quran, <coughs> He does not want an economy in which wealth would circulate only amongst the wealthy. كَيْ لَا يَكُونَ الدُّولَةَ بَيْنَ الْأَغْنِيَاءِ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدَهُزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ That Allah has established certain systems in order that wealth should not circulate only amongst the wealthy. If wealth circulates only amongst the wealthy, then the rich will remain permanently rich and the poor will be imprisoned in permanent poverty. Is that so difficult to understand? The religion which has come from Allah is only one, one religion. That one religion came with Musa, Musa Moses. It came with Ibrahim, Abraham. It came with Jesus, Nabi It came with Muhammad. It didn't come for the first time with Muhammad, Islam. No, it's one religion which came with all, all, all. And that one religion has zero tolerance for oppression. Yes. Zero tolerance for oppression. So if you are in the one religion which has come from the Lord God, whether you are following Abraham or Moses or Jesus or Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon them, if you are in that one religion which has come from Allah, then you must have zero tolerance for oppression. And permanent poverty is oppression. When the poor are permanently poor, that is oppression. I hope the politicians in Trinidad and Tobago will spend a little time to listen to me now before they come to preach Islam to me, when they come hunting for votes for the Muslims in the next election. Listen, listen to me, please, so you know something about this religion of Islam, the one religion which came from the Lord God. It came to all. All through history, one religion. It didn't come, it didn't come, it did not come to the world for the first time with Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him. No. And this one religion has zero tolerance for oppression. So whether you are Christian, whether you are Hindu, whether you are Jew, whether you are Buddhist, whether you are Muslim, whatever you are, provided that you have your beliefs in that one God, you will have zero tolerance for oppression. And when the poor are permanently poor, that is oppression. Why can't you understand that? They don't teach that at the Hugh Wooding Law School. And that was what Venezuela was. The United States of America and the Western world were in such total charge of Venezuela because Venezuela has enormous oil reserves and gold reserves and other things of, of value. So Venezuela was extremely important for them. No country in the whole of the Western Hemisphere other than Canada was more important for the United States than Venezuela. Yeah. And so they had their hands on Venezuela from day one. And their, pro their procedure, their strategy, the, the Western world's strategy, modern Western civilization, if you did not know, I'm sure you knew it already. I'm just reminding you. Their strategy is that the rich must rule the world and the rich must rule the poor. And then they will take the rich and keep them in their pockets and they'll be able to rule the world. Is that so difficult to understand? You get the rich to rule over the poor and then you get the rich in your pocket 
and you'll rule the world. Is that so difficult to understand? So that's what they did in Venezuela. All the oil wealth that was coming into Venezuela was going to the rich and to outside. And the poor were denied. They were living in permanent poverty until, until Hugo Chavez succeeded in taking control of the country. And then he decided, this is unjust. The wealth of the country must also go to the poor. And that's what they've been doing ever since. And the millions of poor, permanently poor people in Venezuela, for the first time in their lives, they were able to get some economic sunshine. Why don't you remember that before you jump on this Juan Guaido wagon? We recognize Juan Guaido as president of Venezuela. Nonsense. Nonsense. Do you know what Juan Guaido would do when he takes control of Venezuela? It's back to, pay, to poverty. The wealth of the country will again go to the rich and to the outside. And the poor will once more be permanently poor. And you want our votes? Huh? Are you sick in your head? Can't you understand? What kind of a Muslim or Christian or Jew or Hindu you are? Then you cannot stand against oppression. You cannot stand for the sake of the oppressed. Well, let me tell you what is Islam. If the, if the Muslims around you don't know it, let me tell you what it is. I'm sorry that I have to get so agitated now, but I will not allow you to come and take my Muslim community. Let me give you a warning. This is Islam. It doesn't come from any Mawlana. It comes from the Lord God. It comes from the Quran. Allah has given to this community who follows Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him. Allah has given to us a mission. If you did not know it, let me tell it to you. The mission he has given to us is Amar bil ma'aruf wa nahi anil munkar. What does it mean? Let me tell you what it means. So when next election time come and you come to get my vote, let me tell you what it means. Amar bil ma'aruf wa nahi anil munkar means if it is right, stand up for it. And if it is wrong, it is unjust, it is oppressive, it is wicked, stand up against it, regardless of the price you have to pay. That is a Muslim. That is a believer in the one God. If you are a Christian, you are my brother, this is your mission as well. We invite you to come and join us. And it is wrong, it is unjust, it is oppressive that the poor should remain permanently poor. Yes, Chavez made mistakes. And Maduro made mistakes as well. How do, you, how do you ensure that the wealth of the country goes to all the people so that the poor do not remain permanently poor? How do you get wealth to circulate through the economy so that the rich don't remain permanently rich and the poor don't remain permanently poor? If the Islamic Republic of Pakistan don't know it, Nothing. They don't even know the, the, the uh, A to Z of the subject. The elementary of the subject, the Pakistani governments never known it. All through the history of Pakistan. How do you expect Venezuela to know it? Huh? Pakistan, from the day it was born to this day, is simply that same kind of economy. Where wealth circulates only amongst the wealthy. And the poor are permanently. Well, oh, that's Pakistan from day one. Up to every single government of Pakistan has failed from the beginning up to this day. They don't know. So you can't expect Chavez and Maduro to know. Huh? I have tried to explain in previous lectures what they have to do in Venezuela in order to escape from the sword of inflation. That's the most dangerous weapon that the enemy has, the inflation. Mm. 
And that is when they attack your money. And as the money falls in value, the prices will rise. And as the prices are rising, people will become poorer and poorer. The middle class will now become poor. That's what happened in Venezuela. So when the middle class became poor, they turned against Maduro. And then the rich are becoming poorer, and they're becoming very angry. And the poor who are already poor are becoming poorer. So it's a recipe for disaster, and that is what has happened in Venezuela. What you have to do, but the scholars of Islam are ominously silent. I don't know what to do with them. I can warn them and warn them and warn them and warn them. They wouldn't listen to me. So what to do? Leave them and move ahead. That's right. Try to create a new generation of scholars of Islam who will have eyes with which to see and understand the world today. They cannot understand the world today. They defend the Islamic banking system, which is bogus and fraudulent, and they wouldn't listen to me. It's a waste of my time to sit down and talk to them. I could talk from now until Christmas. They will never accept whatever I have to say. So why bother with them? Listen to what they have to say, and then move on. <laughs> Don't waste your time. The money which we are using now is bogus and fraudulent and haram. They don't know that. I have studied the subject. I know it, and they would not listen to me. You have to mint gold and silver coins and bring them back into the market. Can Venezuela do that? But of course, Venezuela is a producer of gold. And silver is in abundant supply in Mexico. Silver is in abundant supply in Bolivia. Mexico and Bolivia support Venezuela. So why can't you mint gold and silver coins, put them in the market, and Venezuela's inflation is gone? They can't attack you anymore with inflation. Hmm? But I, I could talk to them. I don't know why they wouldn't listen to me. Probably they say, Sheikh, could you get one Muslim country to do that? And then we'll do it. I can't get any Muslim country to do that. And the second thing is, if you do not plant, you cannot reap. That's the law. If you want to reap, you have to plant. Everybody have to plant in order to reap. Only he is able to reap without planting. Who? The banks. The banks are able to reap without planting when they lend money on interest. <laughs> Why? Because they are reaping what we plant. They're living off our sweat like pimps. That's why Allah has prohibited riba. That's one of the reasons why he's prohibited riba. If you have lending money on interest in your economy, then the rich will rule over the poor. That's right. So you have to prohibit it. You cannot have state intervention in the economy to redistribute wealth. It failed in the Soviet Union. It failed in communism. It's failing in socialism as well, but Chavez didn't understand it, Maduro didn't understand it, so that's why we have the mess in Venezuela. But that does not mean that we do not support the oppressed. And I have to now wind up on this session on Venezuela by reminding us that the religion of Islam stands with the oppressed in opposition to the oppressor. And in Venezuela, the masses, the millions of people who were permanently poor are still standing with Maduro because they know that if he goes and Juan Guaido takes over, they return to permanent poverty. So when the bloodshed starts in Venezuela, it's not going to be the kind of gunboat diplomacy you had before. You can't get regime change again that way. Let me tell that to you, Washington. If the bloodshed starts in Venezuela, it's going to be rivers of blood because the millions in Venezuela who support Maduro because Chavez and Maduro brought to them sunshine, economic sunshine that they never had before, they know that if these go, 
they're going back into the darkness of permanent poverty and they have nothing to lose if they die. So they're going to fight. That's right. They're going to fight. And they're going to be bloodshed flowing like a river in Venezuela if the bloodshed starts. I hope it does not start. And I hope those fools, excuse my language, those fools with a capital F in this country who are recognizing Guaido as the president of Venezuela and who are supporting the oppressor, don't you dare come to a Muslim to ask for support, political support. We'll not. We'll turn you out. Let me now turn to the questions. We have 15 minutes left. Uh, some of the answers I've been giving to these questions, look at your pile, which still remains, eh? Look at the pile. <laughs> some of these answers I've been giving uh, have provoked responses from some of you. And uh, I, I gave, excuse me. Someone asked me, if a Muslim wants to convert and become a Christian, is that OK? And maybe my answer was not clear. And this young man responded to me, sent me an email. And then I learned that a man I loved very, very much a Palestinian scholar of the Arabic language. And he was my dear friend in New York when I was living in New York. Omar Abu Namus. Omar Abu Namus was Palestinian. And he was a scholar of the Arabic language. And he was a colleague of mine in, in uh, New York. And I benefited from his company. But I, in all my life, I've never met a more noble human being than Omar Abu Namus. And now I learned that Allah has called him away from the world. And so today, I pay tribute to the memory of that great friend of mine, Omar Abu Namus, rahimahullah. And I pray that Allah might have mercy on his soul. Amen. And, uh, the answer to the question was that we, there is freedom. La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in religion. So if a Muslim wants to leave Islam and go and join any other religion, we can't prevent him. No. If he wants to leave Islam and go and start worshipping uh, Satan, we can't prevent him. He has the freedom to do that. Okay. It is in this context, I said, you, you have the freedom to do whatever you want to do. You want to go and worship a stone, that's your freedom to do it. With, there is no compulsion, except, except if you choose to leave Islam in a manner which jeopardizes the security of the state, then that's treason. This is the law of apostasy. But the law of apostasy applies only in the context of treason. When the security of the state is at stake, then we prohibited you. That's right. And so now, uh, if a Muslim wants to leave Islam and go somewhere else, he used to believe that the Quran is the word of God, the word of the one God. And now he rejects that. Well, no matter where you go, you are kafir. If a Muslim believed that Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, was a prophet of Allah, and you want to leave Islam and go somewhere else, and you no longer believe in Muhammad, alayhi salatu Islam, as a prophet, then you're a kafir. That's it. That's the answer to that, to that question. Now then, uh, let me go back again to this question. I made mention about the Orthodox Christian world, which is led by Russia. And I said that Russia has today become the dominant military power in the world. That's right. And that Russia will remain until the end of the world as a dominant military power. Where did I get this from? Hmm? I got it from the Quran. 
but perhaps it was so new to you that uh, it was difficult to absorb it. But whenever I give my view, remember, I am interpreting the Quran. And if you interpret the Quran and you do not say, Allah knows best, you're a schoolboy. <laughs> you must be able to separate what Allah has said and what you are saying. Allah says something, no, no, there's no doubt about it, that's the truth. But when you interpret what Allah has said, be humble. Recognize this is your interpretation. You must say Allah knows best. You can be right, you can be wrong. Only Allah can confirm. This is Surah to Ali Imran. Only Allah can confirm an interpretation of the Quran. And so I only have 10 minutes left. Oh my gosh. Um, Suleiman alayhi salam. Listen carefully so you don't send me any more emails for clarification, okay? Listen carefully. Suleiman alayhi salam learns about the queen of Saba, Sheba, and that she has this magnificent throne. And he makes an unusual request. Allah has ordered the jinn to work for Suleiman alayhi salam. And if they disobey, they will be punished with terrible punishment. This is in the Quran. Hmm? So he asks the people in his court, who can bring me her throne? Oh, but wait a minute. This is Jerusalem, and that is Yemen, about 2,000 kilometers distance from Jerusalem. How are you going to bring that throne 2,000 kilometers to Jerusalem? How? He says, who can bring me her throne? There is more to this than meets the eye. Ah, you got to think. It's a good thing, you know, to think. And Allah wants you to think, you know, but Darul doesn't want you to think. <laughs> he says, who can bring me this throne? 2,000 kilometers. Are you listening? So amongst the jinn, there are those who are more powerful than others. So the most powerful of the jinn are called the Ifrit. So one of them said, I will bring you the throne before you rise from your court. Well, that is a magnificent feat. It won't be long before he rises from his court, maybe an hour, two hour maximum. And he could bring this throne 2,000 kilometers. So he has to travel and come back. This, therefore, the subject is now physics. The subject is not the scripture of guidance. The subject is physics. How to travel through space and time at great speed. How to send a bullet at great speed. How to send a missile at great speed. He says, I can do it. I will bring that throne for you before you could rise from your court. This is the Ifrit. And there is a reason why Allah has repeated in Surah to Rahman, 31 times for me, ayyi alai rabbikuma to kaziban. When will you learn to think? Have you ever asked yourself why? Has he repeated this 31 times eh, before you dismiss him, Ran Hussein? <laughs> eh? Ah, yes. What can we do? The answer is that the jinn are in contact with a certain people who are also evil. And these two people combined, these two people combined are, are addressed in the Quran, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins, in istata'atum man tanfuzu min aktaris samawati wal-adpan fuzu. 
modern Western civilization without a shadow of a doubt, modern Western civilization without a shadow of a doubt had been able to succeed in the exploration of space, the scientific and technological re revolution as it pertains to space travel as a consequence of this link between the jinn and human beings. Hmm? So the jinn who can do this, bring that throne over 2,000 kilometers within a short period of time, hmm. these are the ones who are now supporting modern West with the scientific and technological revolution. In the Western world, there are also people who recognize it, but they don't call it jinn. They say demons who are part and parcel of the progress of the scientific and technological revolution in the West. These are Western scholars, not me. Now then, what happened after that? Are you listening? Someone in the court, he cannot be a jinn, no. Someone in the court who has the knowledge of the book. That's all the Quran has said. Don't ask me what is the name of the book. Don't ask me what is the name of the book. Don't ask me did you read the book. Did you ask me what is inside the book. Don't ask me these questions. I am only telling you what is there in the Quran. That's all. Someone in the court who had the knowledge of the book. So it's not the Quran, it's not the Torah, it's not the Injil, it's not the Zabur. You want to know the name of the book? Ask Allah. I don't know. That's all the Quran says. Someone in the court who has the knowledge of the book. That's all. Says, I can bring the throne for you before you could wink your eyes. Indicating that there is a book. Don't ask me the name of the book. I don't know. How many times must I repeat it? Someone who has the knowledge of the book. He says, I can bring the throne for you before you could wink your eyes. So there is a book. That is what the story is meant to tell you. The Quran is telling you there is a book. And in that book, there is knowledge pertaining to travel through space and time. Am I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong. In that book, there is knowledge pertaining to space and time. Travel through space and time. And whoever has access to that book, will be able to pursue the knowledge of space and time and travel through space and time at a speed that will look, make these fellows look like the schoolboys. And that is what is happening today. If you are blind, I am not. Russia, within a short period of time, has been able to accelerate its, its penetration of the subject of travel to space and time so that Russian missiles, missile technology today far exceeds the speed at which the missiles can travel. The things they can far exceed anything that NATO is can, can, capable of. And so my conclusion is that Allah has allowed Russia to store that book. Don't ask me what is the name of the book. Don't ask me where the book is located. <laughs> ah, yes, what can I do? My conclusion, you don't have to accept my conclusion. No, there are many other scholars out there. The world is filled with scholars of Islam. You don't have to listen to me. No. My conclusion is that the only way you could explain the phenomenal increase in Russian military technology in terms of space and time, missile technology, that they now ex surpass NATO and they're the dominant military power in the world, is that Allah in his kindness has allowed a people who tru truly follow Jesus. Yes, despite differences we have with them, 
he recognizes them as followers. You don't recognize them as followers of Jesus. I know that. But he recognized them as followers of Jesus. And he has blessed them. And that is the explanation of the phenomenal increase, the position the Russia now occupies in space technology. And, uh, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless those who now turn to the Quran to study the Quran the way I have shown you how to study the Quran. Sorry, I did not get a chance to go to these questions, but next week, inshallah. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah ala ihsani wa shukru lahu ala tawfiqihi wa amtinani. Nashadu an la ilaha illa Allahu wahdahu la sharika lah. تعظيما لشأنه ونشر أن سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى بدوانه وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى عز وجل في القرآن الكريم بعد عوز بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. My respected brothers and sisters, we live in a time and we live in an age where technologically we are at a such an advancement and such a peak like no other time in history. Every day, every year we progress and we become more and more advanced in the world. 20 years ago, you know, they would, you couldn't hold the phone, open the WhatsApp and see someone from the other half of the globe. Today you can hold the phone, you can see them, you can talk to them. It's like if you were there. 20 years ago, you couldn't take a, 20 or 30 years ago, you couldn't take a flight and cross the Atlantic Ocean for eight hours. SubhanAllah, today, the, the, you know, years ago, not only today, years ago, they put the Hubble telescope you know, in the farther, farthest part of the galaxy, nowhere no man has ever ventured before. Technologically, we are advancing. But my respected brothers and sisters, this morning, I went to the vendor, my wife told me she wanted to cook fish. And I went to the vendor and I bought fish for my wife and I heard some very sad news. And it really makes me put things in perspective. You know, she says behind her, and she showed me the house to a young girl. She, she hanged herself because she and her boyfriend had problems. So, you know, it, it made me think right here and then. And I was talking to the lady. Maybe I was talking so nice to the lady, she gave me an extra piece of fish too. You know, and I said, you know, while we are enhancing technologically, and mankind, you know, we are progressing as a nation. What is happening in people's minds? You know, are we going, are we advancing technologically, building, building strong buildings, moving faster in the air, crossing the ocean, going into space, talking to someone from the next part of the world, when still people, they are trapped in their minds. You know, all that individual had to do, and it's very sad because she's young, she's 16 years of age. You know, she just had to say the word, you know, tell someone that, you know, I'm going through problems. The end of the tunnel is not dark. You know, maybe it's dark for you because you cannot see the way out. But just maybe one or two sessions of counseling and she could, she could get her way out, man. You know, so it really makes me put things in perspective this morning. Right here at the vendor, and I was like, we're, we're so advanced and yet people are taking their lives 16 years of age. For what? Because she and her boyfriend has problems. Not her husband, eh? Not her big, you know, they getting a divorce and in marriage and I can't see forward. No, no, no. For a boyfriend, subhanAllah. So, so where are we really going? Today we have people who are saying that we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And technologically we're advancing. But instead of taking two and three and four steps forward, we're taking 10 and 15 steps backward, subhanAllah. We are advancing so much, but people are, you know, it's reprogressing, you know, it's going, it's going in the opposite way. 
Subhanallah, my respected brothers and sisters, that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wal Asr, by time, mankind is in a state of loss. Mankind is in a state of loss. A few weeks ago, we did the life and times of Isa, the miracles of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And, he, and we said that he's one of the greatest signs of the day of judgment. A few weeks prior to that, we did the minor signs of the day of judgment. Today, inshallah, and in another one or two weeks, because I cannot complete this khutbah today, I cannot complete the entire topic today, we're going to speak about the Dajjal. Because it's the end of time. It's about time we know about the Dajjal. It's about time we know what is going to come. It's about time we know how to protect ourselves from the Dajjal. Of the topics that we're going to cover, inshallah, is what is the Dajjal? What is Al-Masih Dajjal? Where is the Dajjal? Is he a man or is he a jinn? What is the description of the Dajjal? 